Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Time for us to check out the front pages of the national dailies. We call it Off the Press. And this morning, we will be joined by Ezekiel Nyaitok uh, to help us understand some of the headlines. I start off with the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. And let's check out the big stories on the Daily Trust newspaper. Now, the bold caption reads, Federal Government unveils 348.7 trillion Naira National Development Plan. And that's boldly written on the Daily Trust. There are several riders. Oshibanjo, Peter Side lead implementation team, uh, private sector to drive initiative with 85% contribution. Plan likely to create jobs, wealth, expert. And uh, that's what you find on the Daily Trust. Now, moving away from that bold caption, you also have Paris Club, how state, local government, directed deduction of fees. Malami is quoted on that as well. And Senate approves Buhari's 7.6 trillion Naira external loan request. Hmm. Another caption on the Daily Trust newspaper, and away from that, you also um, have this one saying, 31 killed in Taraba and Katsina Emo. More details will be available on the Daily Trust newspaper. And 2022, INEC budgets 1.3 billion naira for funerals and Christmas bonus. Others, uh, that's what you find. Oh, that's quite huge. IPUB kills three butchers and seven others in Imo State. Uh, that's also another one you find this morning. It's important that you pick up a copy uh, if you so want to. Uh, but just before we move away, you also find APC Mium as Buhari Bajabi Amila orders congratulates Soludo. That's the much we can take on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. All right, so the Daily Independent, inflation may shoot up as year winds down, says analyst. Kano's lawyers stage walkout as court adjourns trial. Also, South-South senators reject inclusion of other regions in NDDC. Nigeria is ready for business, says CBN governor. And also, 2011 to 2025 National Development Plan estimated at 348.7 trillion naira on the way, says the FEC. Buhari PDP candidate Ozigbo uh, and Ohaneze congratulate Soludo. Saruwiwa, eight others deserve exoneration, not pardon, Pandav tells Buhari. Also, earned allowances, sharing formulas, stakeholders won Asu, Nasu and Sanu against strike. We can also uh, see here on the Daily Independent, Senate ignores red flag, OK's Buhari's $16.2 billion and 1.02 billion euros loan request. Seek swift prosecution of money launderers, terrorist financiers and smart uh, challenges um, um, colleagues to account also for acquired wealth. All right, let's check out the Nation newspaper this morning. The board caption reads, Governors can't back out of Paris Club debt says Malami, that's the AGF, Attorney General of the Federation. Controversy rages over uh, consultancy fee. AGF, states paying already. That's what you find. Gunmen killed 22 in Imo, Kaduna, Katsina attacks. And Buhari Ngige, Ohaneze, others greet Soludo as he emerges the governor of a number of states. Uh, you also find another header saying, CBN plans single-digit loans for manufacturers. That's also um, a bold caption on the Nation newspaper, not quite bold. And you find Lagos Ogun, Bauchi can't be NDDC member state. Buhari to French investors, Nigeria economy viable. Interesting. Uh, that's the much we can take on the Nation newspaper this morning. All right, and finally on the Punch newspapers, Nigeria's debt stock hits... 42.7 trillion, Senate OK's fresh $16 billion loan. Why we increase Buhari's loan request by $12 billion, says Senator. And more borrowings will put Nigeria in unfavorable conditions, experts are saying. APC governors lobby Malami to stop Buhari from signing an electoral bill. And um, also, uh, speculators lose billions as Naira appreciates exchanges of 540 Naira to a dollar. Uh, Nigeria loses uh, 396 billion naira to Twitter ban, 24 days to six month anniversary. Uh, we can also find here Igboho, how UK firm paid for Cotonou Hamburg flight ticket. 
Assembly orders security meeting as bandits kill 19 in Katsina and Kaduna. Lagos Police Raid Training Camp arrest 108 naval impersonators. And uh, Kano's lawyers stage walkout as DSS Baz Ohaneze and others from proceedings. Good morning to Mr. Ezekiel Nyayetok. Thanks for joining us. Good morning and thanks. All right. Um, I'm sure you, you can pick any of the stories to start from, uh, maybe from Nambi Kano's trial. Uh, it says that the trial has been extended or been pushed all the way to January 19th uh, and 20th after his lawyer staged a walkout yesterday. Uh, quickly share your, your thoughts. I, I think we must be careful about um, what we are doing that we are and how we defend something and um, the intention of which is um, almost more the justice itself. You bring a man to fight, is that supposed to be a big fight? Secondly, what the entitlement of the man? And thirdly, it's the segmentation of just application for Peter as a criteria. What should I expect? What should I expect justice to give me? Should I expect justice to be passionate or not passionate, to be discriminatory? In which case, if I was to be charged uh, with a case like Nam Nikano is, what would I expect? to come to me so that I can know before time how to prepare myself. It could be any case whatsoever. What am I saying is this. To what extent is an individual entitled to a defense in the way that justice is supposed to be said? Now, that is very, very important to me because the way I'm looking at it, I do not know why it should be bad from, you know, attending, you know, uh, the, the, the trial, and at the time like this, they even, they even that, um, that, that point where you, you ought to use a particular system to, like, use a particular tool to kill more than one bird. Right now, the, the agitation in the South East, and you want to go out of your way to show that you are Heaven, you have nothing to hide, that the guy actually does have a case. You want to be so almost too transparent because you want to make a point. Except, of course, there is a hidden agenda. So I think that the government really needs to step up and ask themselves what they really want to achieve. There's what's going on in the Southeast, and coincidentally, I don't know if you notice. Know it coincided with the execution of Ken Weaver. And these are thousands. These are the sort of animations that you want to tell Nigeria that the law is for everybody. You want to use certain circumstances to, you know, become brave names. The things who just couldn't be bothered. They are reckless in the way they get about some of these things. And it's not how government should work. They need to understand the difference between politics and government. They are saying that today your president, our president, is a hat, trying to ask people to come into the country to invest. And these guys, they don't think the way they do. They think in terms of what makes sense. They, they, the world has become a global village. They think in terms of justice and security. Those two things are fundamental to every interest. Even if they speak, am I sure that I get a good deal for my business? The first thing is this. The second thing is the justice system. And if they can do this to their own citizens, then what my case is I go there to invest? You don't have people who are taking government. It's very sad because it affects all of us. Yeah. All right, uh, let's look at the Daily Trust news for this morning. The federal government unveils 348.7 trillion national development plan. I mean, uh, you know, spanning from 1966, we've had several development plan uh, to Vision 2020 and what have you. But mostly, you will find out that our development plans has been, you know, dependent, highly dependent on external borrowings. Do you think that this would make any difference? Or... You know, on, on, on two occasions, 
I have um, put myself up for the governorship of my state, and most likely the third one in 2023. Why is that important? It's because if you think in terms of development plan, we fail to understand the dynamics of development plan. We fail to understand the governance system that we run, which is that we are so much into our glory. And whoever comes back to wants to establish his or her glory. And that's not how government runs. So what do you do when you are trying to bring about a development plan that will have the animation and buy-in of the people? You bring in a substantial part of your system, opposition, and then the peoples. Within the concept of the peoples, you are talking about the academia, where you ask them to bring people, you talk in terms of the business environment, you talk in terms of the youth, the women, the different sections, because what you are saying is that this is our future. So there must be that animation of our future. And because we were all part of it, we can only give you credit as it were for initiating it, then we see it as our thing. When we have that animation, whichever government comes in is likely within a certain um, your span to get a buy in and follow on it. Then when Buhari's administration brings a development plan, that development plan, I can assure you, will die with the Buhari administration. That is within the context of concept. Then there is the funding pattern. Now, how sustainable is our funding, you know, dynamics of the development plan? If it leads on borrowing, the very first thing is that the generations behind it are skeptical. So they are not going to buy it. They are going to say, no, 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 you are piling up debt for us, you are piling up debt for us, you are piling up debt for us. So that is not going to work. But if a development plan is based on the generations coming, their goodwill, their better future, and the funding system is very clearly seen by them, they will be the ones to make sure this works. So I think in terms of the funding dynamics, and the philosophy behind the development plan, both of them, for me, are no, no. I saw them very low, so I don't see it going anywhere far. All right. Uh, well, since you already mentioned, um, you know, um, boring. Uh, now, let's talk about the extra $16 billion that has been sought and has been approved by the National Assembly for the President to, once again, borrow. Um, you know, our uh, debt figures are, uh, you know, hitting, you know, the hitting the heavens, if, if you can describe it that way. Um, the president is once again taking $16 billion and an extra 1 billion euros loan. Uh, share your views on that one also. Some people argue that there's nothing wrong with borrowing. Um, and of course, uh, you know, eventually, of course, will, you know, be benef the benefits eventually will, of course, be shown later. Wait, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The problem that I have, and I continue to say, is that the people in government don't think of the administration after them. They don't. All that matters to them is what can I do so that it should be on the spot that I do. It's selfish, it's self-centered, it's inconsiderate. They just want to be able to say, we did this, we did that, we did. They don't think in terms of, there's no perspective plan. That's why they will borrow your future, they will borrow your children's future, they will borrow just to animate that sort of high history. And I think the time for when that should pick up. People that are getting the government don't get into government to serve you, they don't. They don't. Think about it. Who is that man that is going to pay you to watch your clothes? Think about it. Sometimes we want to have our cake and eat it. So we want that way. Those who want to serve are more often than not that don't have the particular market. Look at what I just said. 
the Anam black people, look at all the people that were lined up to a forensic test and analysis of all of them and say, this man is the person who died. Then they bring their point because that is the matter we serve up. They have defined what governance is. We find the office of the government. We look into this man's past. We don't use diligence, diligence on them. We look 20 years into the past, like 10 years, to see a certain consistency of service, of rectitude, of moral rectitude and character that befits that office. So we are going for him. Instead, what do you have? Oh, the man has capacity. Oh, the man has money. Oh, the party. The party is big. They don't have. They criticize the man that can help them because you don't have structure. What is structure? You are structure. Be his structure. Be his muscle. Be his finances. Put the man in office that will serve you and there will be a difference. Instead, you are allowing these people to go and mortgage their souls to the devil and sell their properties and do everything to come and pay you so that they can come and serve you. Doesn't make sense. So for me, what the Senate president is doing is something that I think he will be unhappy when he leaves office. Have you noticed that there is a caveat to the borrowing? I just want to go and read that myself. And that is that we are giving you approval, but we want you to now send to us the details, the dynamics, the conditions after an approval has been given. Who does that? Who does that? Who in the right thinking does that? I thought the proper thing is, please give us these details. So we put it all together and then take what is called an informed decision. When you give a man an approval and say, give me the details thereafter, you know, it's like pay documentation to be done later. I think that Mr. Senate President should know that he was not, he was not elected to serve the president. He was elected to checkmate the president. That's one of his three core functions. He was not elected to be antagonistic to the president, no. He was elected not to be friend to the president, but to checkmate the president on an audit auditor's platform basis. All right. Um, we'll still stay with the Daily Trust news for this morning. And looking at the budget for INEC, 1.3 billion naira for funeral, Christmas bonus, and what have you. Uh, my question is, do you think it's too much or it's fair? <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean, you have the answer. Next question, please. Food, food stuff is expensive these days. Oh, really? Uh, goats, chickens, rams, they're all expensive. I don't know. Okay, yeah. let's look at it. How much is a bag of to rice To be now? fair to them. <laughs> Let's look at it. To be fair to them, mm. maybe they lose a lot of people during election. Okay, ad hoc staff, main staff. Okay, and secondly, maybe they are looking for ways to try as much as possible to um, kind of uh, appease the people and take their minds away from being bought by politicians. So maybe they get, why I'm trying to look for an excuse is that I actually do have a lot of confidence in the present management of INEC, particularly the chairman. So when a thing like this comes up, I'm trying to look into his mind on why he would do that. So I like think that um, he owes us oh, wow. a certain level of explanation. Well, there's, there's no election in January, so I don't think they're, they need <laughs> you know, to keep them uh, you know, comfortable you know, because but of you, any you, elections. You, you can't fail to talk about motivation and you know, the morale of the workers. I think it really just, for me, it really just tells you know, how expensive uh, foodstuff is you know, today or, or you know, anything that you're buying in the market. You know, it feels like everything is, you know, 150% more expensive than it was in, in 2015. And that's what we're dealing with. You know, I've seen people say that 100,000 naira these days feels like 10,000 naira. Because immediately yes. you, you go out, it's finished. And, and that's what it really says. But another point also is 1.3 billion, how much really would get to the INEX staff? We're in the same country where uh, COVID-19 palliatives were stored in warehouses and never got to the people that they were meant for. So you can budget 1.3 billion, you can budget 3 billion, and, you know, I, and I'm sure that the INEX staff will not, very likely not get you know, any of all these funds you know, sent to them. But let's move on and talk about something, another very sad story. It's on Daily Trust. It says, 
31 people killed in, in three states, I think Taraba and uh, Imo and some other states. Yes, Taraba, Katsina and Imo, 31 people killed. Uh, I think one of the other papers says 19 people were killed in, um, in, a, in a different state. Um, but the, the point is, you know, the, the killings aren't stopping. It says, yes, 19 killed in Katsina and Katuna. And that's on the Punch newspapers. The, the, the murder isn't stopping. The killings is, you know, aren't stopping across Nigeria. And yet, you know, we, we seem to be just moving on. The president is, is, is going for climate uh, conferences and, and the likes. You know, um, this question is becoming very difficult for me to answer because I do not know to what extent any premium is paid on life in Nigeria. It's like we've become mere statistics. So on a daily basis, we are just counting the numbers. Oh, it's not as much as yesterday. Oh, it's more than yesterday. If you sit down and know that lives are lost in dozens and sometimes hundreds on a daily basis, it's not okay. There has to come something. I don't know how that will come in this system. I really don't know because they've become so used to it that it no longer makes any difference to the best of my knowledge to them. I think that as we approach 2023, our conversations should start to start to pay premium on human life. I think our conversation should start to start to say that human lives matter and that the most important thing, as is written, this, this chapter I could never quote enough. <laughs> One of my friends was starting to call me Mr. Chapter 2. You know, Chapter 2, Section 14, Subsection 2B of the Nigerian Constitution says that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Primary purpose shall security and welfare. To what extent do we understand this? And isn't there a solution? There is a solution. The biggest problem that we have is our mindset disposition. The mindset of people in government to a great extent is enterprise, to make money, to get money, contract, contract, so that if you think in terms of peace, they don't think in terms of how to provide employment to the people, how to take the wind off the sail of these um, insurgents. Instead, they are thinking in terms of, oh, the hard way to buy, oh, the Tucano jet to buy. If I had the money and I asked people honestly and sincerely, between buying one Tucano jet and using that same amount, to provide a kind of very, very elaborate, you know, um, entrepreneurial uh, disposition to the people of Northeast, which one will give me a sustainable answer, uh, you know, uh, 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 yes, solution. And it is just as simple as possible that when you take the wind off the sail or you sniff out the oxygen from the fire, the fire will slow it down and out. We've brought all the jets. What has happened? But people have made their money, I would like to believe, and the contract has been done. As the solution come, they have gotten their solution because their solution, to the best of my knowledge, was to make money. They've made the money. But the solution in terms of bringing peace to the region, I don't see that happening. So it comes back to the same thing I've been saying before. Let us start to bring into governance people that care and understand you know, it's like you wanting to be a, a, a soldier, a, a, you know, a, a combatant. You need to know that you're going to be exposed to the, the, the weather, to, to all the avarice, all the, all the, all, all the things that, that, that are uncomfortable. Yeah. It's like you wanting to be a surgeon. You are going to be exposed to blood. But when you say, I don't like to, to see blood and I want to be a surgeon, they just don't agree. What is government? Government is primarily service. But when you're bringing entrepreneurs into government, they're coming to make money. And all their decisions and all their mindsets and all their actions are yeah, going to be sorry, within the, that narrow perspective of how do I make money? Where can I make money? What do I do to get money? That's why education 
is something that brings value to the system but does not bring you immediate returns in on investment money so they don't like education they don't like housing but they like the things that they will have to buy and make money and then what should go for a thousand dollars they will put it at five thousand dollars at the end of the day we have enough money in this country to do what we want some days back let me say this at maybe uh, very important I was privileged to, ho to host one Alaji Kwankoso on my birthday. And the reason was that I asked him a certain question. Is it true that for eight years you were the governor of Kano State, you did not borrow a dime? He said, yes. He didn't get it from international agencies. He didn't get it from local. He did not borrow 10 naira. The money you have can do the work if you do not want to divert the money into your own private estate or private pocket. And I found that instructive. Mr. Peter Obi did it in, 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 in Anambra State. I can bring out people who have gone into government and have gotten to serve and have done their work and have left with indelible marks on it. In education, you can see, if there are examples like this, why can't we as Nigerians go back to interrogate? Right. Every governor is thinking, okay, yeah, borrow, 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 borrow. If a governor was able for eight years to stay and do a lot of work without borrowing, I think the time has come for us to start to do a kind of a synthesis on all these people and be able to bring a paradigm to our governance structure in the future. That conversation should be now. All this issue of conversing on borrowing and lives and everything, we need to have an alternate platform where we start to think in terms of the security of the people, the welfare of the people, and the fit for purpose in terms of people in that we bring to manage our resources. All right, Ms. Ayan, talk. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, as always, on Thursday mornings. And uh, we enjoy your conversations and wish you a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Many thanks. All right. And, uh, of course, that's uh, where we wrap up uh, today in, um, no, rather, off the press. And we're now going to be sharing with you a little bit of what happened today in history on the 11th of November. We're going back to the year 1992. And this happened after 17 years of campaigning. The uh, church eventually voted to allow women to become priests. This happened once again in 1992. The Church of England narrowly voted uh, to allow the ordination of women as priests, breaking the church's uh, tradition of a male-only clergy, despite the opposition of uh, about 1,000 clerics who threatened that they would resign. The General Synod, the main council of the church, voted to allow the ordination of women. All three houses of the church body approved the measure by the necessary two-thirds majority vote. It was, uh, like I mentioned, the result of more than 17 years of campaigning and was expected to alienate many within the church. About 1,000 priests from the Church of England have, you know, at that point also threatened to leave, but obviously didn't if they approved the ordination of women. But eventually did go ahead on this day in 1992 to approve the ordination of women. But we still don't see that many female priests. You actually took that out of my mouth. Uh, Especially, well, you know, in this part of... I don't know. Maybe they're not very... Uh, I don't know, but, you know... Nigerian Is there any space. female priests in Nigeria? Uh, you know, I've seen tent makers. I, I really don't know, but I, I still see them, you know, dressed in this attire and what have you. But, you know, to say like a priest, priest, an actual priest, oh, well, not like... Well, th this is for the Church of England, or maybe it doesn't cover the... Um, I'm, I'm thinking it could just, it, it cuts across, it might just cut across the entire uh, Roman Catholic Church. I've never actually seen a female priest. But I have seen female who are dressed in priestly attire. You know, you have um, different churches. I mean, sometimes you could see the Presbyterian, you know, yeah. you see the Methodist church and all of that. And you still find some of those women uh, dressed like priests, but they're actually not priests. And sometimes you, you, you find out that they're being called tent makers and what have you. But they're still doing the work of the Lord. I mean, not necessarily being a priest. <laughs> I've just never, never seen any... any you know, yeah. I, I was, if you were I, a woman, I, I, I probably would suggest that you should think in that direction. But of course, you're not a woman. So we'll just let that slide. Yeah. I, I'm not thinking in that direction. <laughs> All right. We'll take a short break. When we come back, our first major conversation for today, uh, we're talking standard operating procedure for search and rescue once again. And of course, it's really just to continue the conversation with respect to those who lost their lives in the Koyi building collapse. That comes up after the short break. Good morning. <laughs>